Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh once again. Uh, today, we are going to continue with a uh, discussion on the topic um, undue influence, uh, specifically uh, elements okay, of presumed undue influence. So in the previous lecture, we have uh, discussed up, I mean, we have completed the discussion for the first element. Okay, So the first element actually, um, it concerned with uh, uh, proving okay, requirement of uh, the person or the the one who asserted undue influence is in the position to dominate the will of uh, the other or the, the shorter uh, shorter ways okay of saying it is like we are, we want to prove the elements of domination or dominant position and we have that we have done that and as far as our contracts act is concerned uh, it is contained in section 16 subsection 2 okay uh, you can uh, I mean, you can cross refer or you can refer to your own statute after this. So for today, we are going to focus on the second element of presumed undue influence. Okay, we are not concerned with uh, actual undue influence because this second element is not relevant okay, for actual undue influence. So um, second element, uh, it revolves around unfair advantage or the proper way, I mean, the proper wording or proper phrases here is that obtaining unfair and unfair advantage and uh, where do we find this particular um, element actually if you refer to your section 16 section 1 you can see okay, the word unfair advantage but it doesn't say this is the second element for presumed undue influence because that one uh, I mean uh, it, we know about it uh, it is derived from case law from uh, from cases lah, okay, the interpretation of the section so basically uh, unfair advantage is the second requirement okay, to prove uh, presume and you influence and sometimes uh, another related uh, phrases related words um use is manifest disadvantage okay advantage which is, which is unfair or disadvantage which is manifest which is so obvious all right so when we talk about, I mean, when you see the word manifest disadvantage here, actually it denotes or it means disadvantage, which is so obvious to whom? To, to any independent and reasonable person. I mean that here, um, people generally will say, oh, this is something which is really to the disadvantage okay, of the plaintiff or of the claimant. And another uh, related word is unconscionable. Okay, and this the, the word unconscionable. You can see it in uh, uh, section sixteen. Okay, subsection uh, uh, three. Okay, I think I better show the section. Okay, let me let me reshare. Okay, contrast act to make it. Um, Okay, just now, um, I mean, we were discussing the word unfair advantage, okay, it is very clear from 16, subsection 1, okay, the last, uh, the last sentence or the last uh, lines here, okay, blah, 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 and then uses that position to obtain an unfair advantage over the other. Okay, just now, the word unconscionable, okay, we zoom to 16, subsection 3, uh, clause A. Okay, class A, uh, one, two, three, four, fourth line. Okay, here, yeah, where a person who is in a position to dominate the will of another enters into contract with him, and the transaction appears, okay, uh, on the face of it or on the evidence adduced, okay, to be unconscionable. So that's the word unconscionable. Okay, so we are coming back to uh, this. I mean, I'm resharing. Uh, slides okay just now all right so unconscionable okay what's the meaning of the word unconscionable okay it has a general meaning basically okay unconscionable is like whatever things that you do uh i mean beyond your conscious lah okay or something which is really unfair actually okay all right so example of transaction example of contract which is very common is sale of property which is undervalued it's like um uh, it is a red, red flag, lah, basically. Okay, why, why you are selling the property at undervalue? So if you look deeper, oh, there's fiduciary relationship between them and then um, it is so unfair. Okay, the effect of the transaction, it is unfair or it is something which is unconscionable. So we have the case of Posaturai and Kanapachatya. This is a case from uh, India, okay, all Indian uh, AIR, okay, all Indian uh, report. And we also have, okay, we are we are now re-discussing, discussing again the case of 
polygram records and uh, the search. If you remember, okay, we discussed it under fiduciary relationship. And then actually uh, the group okay, when they were, I mean, they were in breach uh, uh, of the contract and then they tried to defend their case. And for the first element, they managed to prove it. Okay, they managed to uh, convince the court with their argument that Eric, okay, the managing director, stood in the um, confidential relationship with them. But they are also trying to prove whatever contract that they have signed, two contracts actually, it was, uh, it were, I mean, they were unfair to them. Okay. All right, but if you read the case further, actually the court did not agree okay, with the um, with the argument by the by the by the search lah, by the by the defendant or by by, by the group here. Why is that so? Because uh, when they sign the agreement, it is with their consent, and then they know okay the royalty rates actually, and they agreed uh, when at the time of execution of the contract, but only later okay. They regret. I mean, they are not happy uh, with the with the rate of the royalty. So that's why um, they complain whatsoever, and then they decided to breach the contract. So basically, but they receive royalty actually, but they are not happy with the rate. Okay, it's not that zero royalty here. So the court came to the conclusion actually it was at the at the time of signing the agreement it was fair to them because they have um I mean they have the option whether to sign or not to sign or actually they have to negotiate if they are not happy with the rates from the very beginning so after that they are not happy with it or maybe they regret signing the contract whatsoever so it's too late I mean they they would be in breach lah and that's what happened um in the case of polygram records and this so first element was fulfilled but second element of proving unfair advantage was not fulfilled. You might want to read the case of Posatura and Kana Project yeah, uh, on your own. Uh, I think it should be in your textbook or if not, you can uh, read uh, anywhere okay, to know what happened in the case of Posatura and Kana Project. Yeah. Okay, this is another explanation with regards to uh, unfair advantage. Okay. Um, in normal uh, transaction, for example, uh, it involves sale and purchase. So usually the court will look at the value of the property. Is it sale at under value? Okay. That will be one of the factors or indication that uh, to I mean uh, to to lead towards un unfair advantage, okay, or to lead towards uh, um, under influence, okay. But what if the transaction involved is a gift? Okay, what is a gift? A gift is something that don. Okay, we have the word dono and doni okay, in relation to donation. So give more or less is similar to donation. So dono give away okay the property the gift uh, to the doni. Okay, but the donor doesn't receive anything in return. So it's like one way only. Okay, so for give, okay, um, there's no need to prove unfair advantage. Meaning they automatically unfair advantage is proven. All right, why, why is that so? Okay, because in give, there is no benefit move, okay, uh, no consideration move from, uh, I mean, to the plaintiff, to the donor, to the one who give away the property. So automatically, it is something which is really unfair. Okay? If it is sale and purchase, I mean, there is exchange of consideration, benefit move to the plaintiff or to the donor. So meaning that here, um, if uh, the, uh, the challenge, okay, the impugned transaction is in the nature of gift, the plaintiff only needs to prove the first element, okay? only prove the domination because unfair advantage is considered as proof straight away. Okay? So because it falls under exception to the rule, okay? no need to prove unfair. Advantage. So it becomes easier okay, for the um, complainant over the plaintiff. All right. And then, uh, like I said just now, okay, in cases of gift, uh, the mere proof, okay, just proof to the court existence of relationship between the parties. Okay? It could be by way of fiduciary, it could be, could be by way of um, person with authority, okay, higher authority, or maybe a mental incapacity. So having proving that, okay, uh, it is sufficient okay, to raise the presumption. That will be the next stage okay, after both elements are being fulfilled. If you refer to the case of the one that we case, uh, the one that we discussed uh, earlier, okay, the case of Inchinoria, as well as uh, Rosli Daros, okay, both transaction was in the nature of gift. So that's why um, I mean the case was successfully proved okay, under presume and you influence. Okay, now we come to the next stage or the next step after proving both elements. Okay? Bearing in mind, we are discussing presume and you influence. For actual, okay, you won't come to this uh, stage because there's no presumption involved. But for presume and you influence, the word itself, okay, presume. So in what, uh, at what stage a presumption uh, will be raised at this stage? I mean, after uh, the complainant or the plaintiff prove both elements, then a presumption will be raised, okay? 
and after presumption is raised, uh, uh, it shift to uh, it shift to the the other party. It shift to the uh, it shift to the defendant. Lah. Okay, it shift to the one who is being uh, I mean who has who has dominated. Okay, uh, who has dominated to ensure the transaction uh, was uh, I mean was entered by both parties. Yeah. So the law raises the presumption. Okay, once the complainant, once the plaintiff, once the victim. Prove both elements, okay, uh, that is domination and unfairness. But bearing in mind, if it is a gift, then uh, unfairness is no need to, to be proved, okay. So, why, what, what's the importance, okay, what's the significance of this presumption, okay? Why we are so concerned with this presumption? Because it makes the case easier, okay, for the complainant. It absorbs, okay, it discharge or it release, okay, complainant from having to prove that the wrongdoer expressly used or asserted undue influence on the complainant because we are not sure whether the um, undue influence really took place or not. Okay, that's why the court just uh, assume, okay, assume, oh, yeah, you were under undue influence and there's no need to prove further, no need to prove real evidence that you were really under undue influence. Okay, this one is, uh, I mean, this is the uh, the difference okay, between actual and Presume because for actual, you need to prove evidence. I mean, provide evidence to the court that you were really under under influence. But for presume, the court will presume. Okay, the presumption will be made. So in that sense, okay, the complainant is absolved from um, having to prove or to produce real evidence, okay, whatever evidence, okay, straight or direct evidence, okay, that um, under influence really uh, existed. Okay, when he signed uh, into the agreement. Okay, now we have, I mean, now presumption is being raised. Okay, the next step, uh, what happened next? Okay, now uh, it, it is now on the part of the, um, on the party, on the dominant, okay, dominant party to rebut the presumption. So it is fair. I mean, both parties can prove their case. Okay, complainant prove the two elements. Now, uh, presumption is being raised on the part of the dom dominant party. For example, the, 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 the defendant, it could be plaintiff as well. Okay, he has the right. Okay, legal rights to rebut the presumption. I mean, it is just a mere presumption. We presume it happened. Is it possible to rebut? Yes, it is possible okay, to be rebutted. So how to do it? How to rebut the presumption which is now being raised? Because without the rebuttal, we consider, okay, we assume it, it is there. I mean, we consider the, the transaction is being affected with undue influence. Okay? So the most usual way or the most common way is to prove that the victim the plaintiff had independent legal advice okay, before entering into the transaction because sometimes legal advice is not really independent. I mean, still it won't uh, it won't rebut okay, the presumption. So uh, generally, okay, the word is dominant party. Okay, the dominant party can rebut the presumption by showing this thing. Okay, any of this thing here, for example, uh, prove to the court, okay, show to the court that transaction was the result of free exercise of the victim's independent will. I mean. When you decided to enter, it is your free will, okay, and you are free. I mean, to say to say yes or to say no, to decide uh, to enter or to sign or not to sign, okay. Even without showing that the victim received independent legal advice, so long the plaintiff actually uh, gave free consent, because sometimes there's no legal advice involved, there's no role of solicitors involved here. It depends on the nature of transaction, okay. But then, the most usual way, okay, the easiest way, straightforward way is that. Proof that victim had independent legal advice. So most of the time, it is very strong evidence okay, in favor of the dominant party. If the victim had actually independent legal advice, so it's very hard for the plaintiff to say, "Oh, I didn't know," or "I, I it is against my free will," or so ever. Okay. And another thing to be proved by um by the dominant party is that uh, proof to the court that the victim understood. Okay, understood whatever that he was signing, whatever he was doing, and that was his mental act. I mean, uh, I mean, usually you know what's the implication. Okay, when you sign, is it giving away the whole right in the property, for example? Okay, and there's no one actually who influenced you to sign the agreement. Okay, that's why whenever the the victim, okay, whenever the weaker party is being is having mental incapacity, it's very hard to prove that he understood, he or she understood. Okay, so mean the the presumption remains. Okay, cannot be. About that, like in Chinoria, for example, how do you prove that he or she understood? Or even Rosalie Daros, okay, this girl unemployed and then, um, I mean, dependent very much, okay, or on the guardian, okay, adopted uncle. So it's very hard to prove that he understood, okay, whatever that he was signing or to give away the property wholly.
Okay, and we have all these cases uh, in relation to rebutting the presumption. We have the case of Penyelan Osman. You might want to refer it later. We also, I mean, we discussed already the case of Lim Kim Hua. Okay, it's about um, uh, more or less similar to in China. Okay, but that one, this one reported in MLJ. And we also have the case of Tate and Williamson. Okay, uncle and undergraduate nephew. And then there was legal advice, but it was not really independent because the lawyer uh, wasn't aware of the or wasn't um, doesn't didn't have access to surveyor's report in which the uncle was the one who had the surveyor's report. So eventually, um, uh, the presumption wasn't rebutted. Okay, in Lim Kim Hua, well, it wasn't rebutted. In Tate, uh, it wasn't rebutted, even though there was an effort to rebut the presumption. Okay, so we are done with uh, all the steps, okay, all the uh, stages okay, of proving the case of presumed undue influence. So uh, more or less, actually, the case is pro proving by way of, uh, we just presume it happened. And then uh, we give the right uh, to the other party to rebut. Okay? If no rebuttal, then yes, it happened. I mean, on the balance of probability, the victim okay, will win the case, basically. All right. Now, so now we have another... Um, a subtopic, okay, small topic under under undue influence, okay, which is constructive notice of undue influence, okay, notice which is being construed, okay, in relation to undue influence. So what 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 is all about here? Actually, it refers to the legal fiction, okay, uh, that signifies, okay. A person, usually a bank actually, okay, a person or entity should have known. I mean, you should know. Okay, we we assume that you know, or we construe that you know, okay. As a reasonable person, okay, would have a, of a legal action taken or to be taken, even if they have no actual knowledge of it. Usually we just uh construe. I mean, we just assume you should know, okay. Okay, what is the um example so that it will be clearer? The okay, example here, okay, it involves Purchaser and buyer, for example, okay, where a purchaser fails to make a reasonable or necessary investigation, so he will be deemed, okay, so meaning that you are being construed to know, he will be deemed to have had notice of what would have been discovered had he made the normal and customary inquiries. For example, um, uh, purchaser and buyer, a purchaser and vendor, okay, if purchaser has investigated uh, further, he will have known, oh, actually, the earlier transaction was being uh, affected by undue influence. Okay, he will have discovered that. Okay, so in that situation, um, law might impose okay, constructive notice on the one who didn't make the reasonable investigation. In the here, we assume that you know. If you actually check, you will know. So we construe that you know. Okay, and most of the time, uh, with regards to cases, case law, okay, it involves financial institution because um, usually they are the one who give loan and then. Um, the, the loan contract is being, has the guarantor being guaranteed. Okay? And then usually there will be a relationship between borrower and the guarantor. That's what happened in the case of Southern, Southern Bank and Abdul Rauf Rakinan. Kan? I give you the case, if I, remember, if I remember correctly, and it involved as well. I mean, uh, it is mentioned. Okay? The word constructive notice was mentioned. Lah. More or less, it's quite relevant. Okay, So the greatest risk on the part of the bank Okay enforceability of the loan contract because it might be affected with any influence and then cannot enforce it. It cannot get back the money in the loan. Uh, possibility of constructive notice of undue influence. But I think the latest practice by the bank, they have all the uh, forms okay, to be signed by the guarantor. Uh, I mean, so that later, if anything happened, okay, the guarantor cannot say, oh, actually I was under undue influence. But those days, maybe there's no such practice. This one, way back in year 2000. Okay, now there's 2022. So in order to um, give the loan, to approve a loan, said, lots of documents lah, to be signed, especially by a guarantor. The guarantor will be in the shoes of the borrower if the loan is defaulted. All right. So from the very beginning, the bank has to make whatever necessary um, uh, documentation or investigation to make sure the contract is not being affected with a new influence. Otherwise, okay, there will be constructive notice imposed on the bank. Okay, if the bank doesn't do the re reasonable investigation. In Southern Bank, there was no such thing. Like, I mean, there was no reasonable investigation by um, by Southern Bank okay, when uh, the wife of Abdul Rauf uh, stood as the guarantor. Okay, this is the last part of our topic discussion. Effects and remedies. What happened to the contract which is being affected with a new influence? Okay? So assuming that both elements are being fulfilled and then it cannot be rebutted, okay, what is the effect? Can we enforce the contract or not? 
basically yes and no. I mean yes or no. It is voidable. It's possible to uh, to be valid and usually the party try to avoid, try to invalidate the contract. So in that in that uh, situation, it is void. Okay. Uh, how do we know from section twenty two? Okay, we still have time. So we go to section 22 to see what are your contracts at? Section 20. This one 16. Okay, section 20. Okay, here. Right. Power to set aside contract induced by undue influence. So section 20 is uh, specifically for undue influence. If you notice, section 19, okay, 19, yeah, uh, it covers the okay, agreement affected by caution. Okay, we have discussed earlier, as well as fraud and or misrepresentation. Meaning there are three topics okay, uh, applicable for section 19. But for section 20, the one that we are discussing now, is only applicable or specifically meant for undue influence. So when a contract, I'm uh, sorry, when consent to an agreement is caused by undue influence, the agreement is a contract voidable. Okay, at whose option? Who has the right to make it avoidable? At the option of the party whose consent was so caused. Okay, I mean that here the one, the weaker party, the one who is being dominated. And um, I mean, what's the effect? Any such contract may be set aside. The word is maybe. I mean, maybe in some other situation cannot be set aside. So maybe set aside either absolutely or if the party who is entitled to avoid it has received any benefit. Okay, receive the price or receive the property. So, I mean, uh, the court will make necessary order okay, to restore the party back to their, to their earlier position because now they want to set aside the contract. Illustration, is it relevant or not? Yeah. Okay, uh, let's, let's read illustration B here. A, a money lender advanced okay, 100 ringgit to B, who was B, an agriculturist, and by undue influence, okay, uh, A induced B to execute a bond okay, for 200 ringgit with interest at 6%, okay, very high interest per month. So now the court may set aside, uh, sorry, may set the bond aside. Okay? The bond is transaction. So ordering B to repay the 100 ringgit with such interest as may seem just. Media, whatever contract which is being affected by undue influence, the court may. Um, I mean, may make necessary order okay, to restore back the party to their earlier position. Because advances are received, so can order lah to repay. Okay, repay. I mean, return whatever that you have received whatsoever. Okay, we go back to the slide. We are about to finish our slide. Okay, now it's um, ending, okay? All right, so remedy is rescission. Okay, the con a contract may be set aside lah, can be. Uh, rescinded, and this is actually the formality for you. Uh, for your extra knowledge, okay. Usually in exam, uh, we don't expect students to discuss about uh, how to make rescission here. This is for your knowledge, lah. Okay, Re rescission, rescission here, rescind. Okay, how to rescind a contract? This is the ways, lah. Okay, uh, usually by giving notice to the other party that you are rescinding the contract. Okay, you can uh, read section sixty seven later, contracts act, or another way is uh, under a specific relief act. Okay, it talk about all the remedies, lah, relief. So by way of application to the court, usually this is another common uh, procedure. Okay, you need to apply to the court in order to set aside the contract. You cannot simply, um, uh, hey, I want to set aside the contract and you do it. Usually you, you have to make it uh, in an official manner, lah, formal manner. So you apply to the court under section 34, section 1A. Okay? And then what happened next? Okay, whatever benefit received, okay, has to be restored, has to be repaid lah, basically. Okay. If nothing has moved, then okay lah. I mean, we just maintain the status quo. But usually, benefit has uh, been received. So we have to restore okay, the parties back to their earlier position if it is still possible. And this is the assumption. I mean, here, in some exceptional situation, it's not possible to restore. I mean, the, the property has passed hand to the third party. How do you restore? How do you compel? How do you enforce? Okay. Uh, how do you make the other party, the, the third party, to restore? Because the third party is not a party to the earlier contract, okay, under privity. Right, so complainant, okay, even though the contract is being affected with undue influence, complainant may lose his right to rescission, cannot rescind okay, under three situations. Okay, the first one, bona fide purchaser for value without notice. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. And then the second one, affirmation. Okay, minute here, complainant affirm. Okay, later only you want to complain. So it's too late. Lah. Okay, the moment you affirm, then 
is considered valid. Okay, nothing. Uh, I mean, cannot restore. Okay, cannot set aside. Cannot. Uh, you. Uh, we cannot back off from uh, the transaction. And the third one is latches. Okay, there are three. Uh, three uh, possible exceptions or situations here. Okay, bona fide bona fide purchaser for value without notice. So third party subsequent purchaser who has who who was who is not aware of the earlier transaction. Which is being affected by undue influence, okay? So he can retain the property. He has the right, okay, legal right over the property. No need to return the property to the uh, to the real uh, owner, okay? Provided uh, he is the one who is bona fide, good faith, lah. Okay? If he is aware or he is uh, the accomplice, for example, okay, then he has to return here yeah, bona fide purchaser for value. There must be payment of money. If it is by way of gift, still can ask to return. Here yeah, it must be for value. So it is, uh, I mean, if you want to refer later to your specific relief act, it is contained in section 26, section B. And the case uh, which is relevant here is Tengku Abdullah Ibn Sultan Abu Bakar bin Muhammad Latif. Okay, uh, this, this is the second exception, affirmation, affirm. So uh, the law, okay, whenever the, the, the contract involved, I mean, is being affected with undue influence, the law requires that the victim must act quickly, okay, soon after he 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 is now free from domination. Cannot simply wait everything or I want to set aside or no. Okay, you have to act quickly. Otherwise, the court will say, oh, you affirm, you are okay with it. I mean, uh, no, I mean, you cannot get the remedy later. Okay, this is what happened in Alcott and Skinner. Okay, for the will, she revoked it immediately. So the decision was in her favor. But for, to claim for the return of stock, she waited for six years. Okay, even though um, I mean, by right, she can still claim, but then um, because of this delay, okay, uh, wait, wait, the wait for six years, okay, very long. So the court assume, oh, you have affirmed, okay, because for the will, you act immediately. Why, you, why, why did you wait for six years? So she lost her right to recession because uh, impliedly you affirm okay, the transaction. Okay, latches. Actually, latches uh, it could be overlapping with affirmation here. But latches, the focus is on the time factor. Okay? Lapse of time and delay in prosecuting a claim. So in that particular situation, court will refuse to give its uh, aid, its assistance, okay, where the plaintiff has slept. He do not slept upon his right and acquit. So as if you are okay with it, okay? Meaning that here, uh, you agree, um, I mean, uh, the plaintiff agree tacitly impliedly or silently you agree and then um, you let it go okay for a great length of time only later you decided to bring the case to the court no okay you will be barred because of latches not because of time fact i mean not really not really because um uh, the, the limitation act whatsoever here this is about latches lah okay but how long is long actually here it depends on the nature of transaction for example in saan marwi and chan hua hua okay hwa hwa UA, Chan Hua Hua. So this is appeal case. In this case, respondent, he delayed for uh, not one to three months, yeah, 19 months, more than a year, okay, before he decided to bring a claim okay, against the, the appellant. So the court held that the delay here, okay, respondent's delay, actually, this is, uh, it amounts to latches. And the delay alone okay, was a sufficient ground to dismiss his claim. So the court didn't bother with whatever statement of claim whatsoever. Okay, the court looked at the delay and it is, uh, I mean, the case is thrown uh, out of the window lah. Basically, why you waited and for 19 months and you are claiming for undue influence. Okay, undue influence, the moment you are being released or free from undue influence, act quickly okay, to get back your rights. Yeah. You waited for 19 months, so it is latches. And in a way, you affirm the transaction actually. So latches and affirmation could be overlapping, but latches focus more on the time factor only. Okay. All right, this is your optional. Okay, I think that's all for the topic um undue influence. Let me stop record.